Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 28, 2023. I'd like to invite the scouts of Troop 475 out of Parkville to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And now for a moment of silence. Thank you to Scout Troop 475 who are here tonight to fulfill a requirement for their citizenship in the Community Merit Badge. Thank you. Tonight's board meeting, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV. Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Vios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call votes. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 28th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any additions or changes. Hearing none, the, agen the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service, and certificate of appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So moved, Harvey. Thank you, do I have a second? Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Madam Chair Lichter and Vice Chair Harvey and members of the Board of Education, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval, manager, quality assurance, and the Office of Enterprise Solutions. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as it presented in Exhibit E1? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. 
Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Williams? Yes, thank you. Our first and only appointment tonight is uh, for Kurt Rollins as the Manager of Quality Assurance in the Office of Enterprise Solutions. Uh, we want to welcome him to Baltimore County Public Schools. Previously, he served as the Director of Quality Engineering Contrast Security, and he brings over 20 years of service in IT and quality assurance. So congratulations, Kurt Rollins. At this time, I'd also like to give the floor to Dr. Williams. Yes, thank you, Chair Lichter. Numerous members of the Hampton Elementary School community have sought solutions to address overcrowding. The administration and I have heard your concerns. Staff members from the Department of Schools and Facility Management and Strategic Planning and the Offices of Early Childhood Special Education, Transportation, Food and Nutrition, services have identified both short-term and long-term solutions to relieve overcrowding in the cluster. A letter will be sent to the community this week explaining how immediate relief for the upcoming school year will be provided. The Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning is also investigating interim solutions to include additional relief pursuant to the emergency provision in the superintendent's rule 1280. More information regarding this option to include public participation is forthcoming. Please be aware that as of March 22nd, 2023, current enrollment is 802 students, 802 students. And while analysis of projected enrollment for the next five years require a solution beyond redistricting, we are doing all we can to support success for Hampton. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who were not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel, personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of this time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under the Board of Education Participation by the Public. It is the practice of the board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. First to speak is Delegate Guyton. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. 
And congratulations to all the new members of the board, and hello to some of you I've seen before. Hello, Dr. Williams, members of the board tonight. I'm Delegate Michelle Guyton. I represent District 42B, most of which lies within Councilmanic 3. Um, and I am here because I have heard a lot of concerns from constituents about a couple of different issues go ongoing at this moment. I first want to say thank you, Superintendent Williams, for your remarks before I spoke. Um, I know that my constituents from Hampton Elementary School are here, many of them are here today. And I have been in contact with you and your office, uh, both by letter, through the delegation opportunities, and through our legislative liaison over here, Mr. Tony Bazemore, who is honestly a credit to Baltimore County Public Schools. I mean, he solves so many problems for me and for all of you. So I just have to throw that out there. However, I also have a responsibility to communicate with you the concerns that I hear on a regular basis from those in my constituency. And I've heard a lot about the Baltimore Public Schools redistricting process. Of particular concern, there are two of them, not just Hampton. Particularly concern is the Northeast Central Middle School boundary study that's currently underway, and then also requesting a reevaluation of the boundary study and overcrowding at Hampton Elementary School. The original study, as you've already noted, severely underestimated the population of the school. Um, and I do hear that you're going to send some information out this week really detailing about how you're going to address this problem. I think all that I've heard so far is that there is a plan for learning cottages, which we all know are trailers, yes, um, which may be a very short-term solution, but certainly is not an appropriate long-term one for this community. So through our, um, again, I requested a few months ago, I think actually, with my colleague, Delegate Kathy Forbes, that we reevaluate and look at the process to see how we could alleviate this uh, overcrowding at Hamden Elementary School. And I trust that that's part of what you're going to share with us over the next week. In addition, we have great concerns about the Northeast Central Middle School Boundary Study process, right? Um, you know, one of the goals when conducting the boundary study is to create continuity from elementary to middle to high school. And I know that when I have written and we've uh, shared our concerns with the superintendent pri uh, previously through the delegation meeting, which we really appreciate you being open to doing that, to listening to us and answering our questions. Um, you know, we did call upon the uh, Baltimore County Rule 1280, which you referenced a few moments ago. And I think that people are interpreting that in very different ways. Basically, Rule 1280 says that those affected schools need to be a part of this process. But what we're actually finding is that um, the students and families that will be affected, not the, those who are currently in middle schools, which are part of the process, but the ones that are going to be most directly affected by this redistricting are not part of the process currently. And hopefully, part of what you'll share with us this week, though you didn't detail it, will include plans to change that. So I believe that all families from impacted schools should have a voice in the boundary studies impacting their school zone, pursuant to how a lot of other people interpret Baltimore County Rule 1280. And by involving all stakeholders based on those criteria, the Baltimore County School Boundary Study process will be much more equitable and fair. It, this is going to affect more than 30,000 students, and we believe that the best way to ensure that it is, in fact, a responsive and fair redistricting process is to consider pausing it until a few things happen. First of all, you actually have participants from the stakeholder schools, the elementary schools who are going to be affected by this, and also possibly until the Baltimore County Board of Education has been fully filled with appointed members. You guys are doing a great job, but you're not fully seated yet, and so there are going to be other opinions and other people who are gonna to wanna to have some input into this, hopefully soon. Um, and then given the fact that our superintendent is also going to be leaving us, it might be appropriate to work with a new superintendent on making these decisions. So I really appreciate your time. I know personally that your job is not an easy one, and I really, really appreciate all of your willingness to serve and to be in this position because I understand how difficult it is. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for listening to my constituents and to me and being responsive to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
I'll now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. And our first speaker is Dr. Barbara Desmond. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams. Um, first, let me make one thing clear. I have no intention of coming back to work for Baltimore County Public Schools, so I'm not auditioning. Um, I came to talk to you tonight as a board and to have you just to reiterate to you the fact that you have to ask questions when you receive data presentations, especially at this critical stage in events in Baltimore County when you, I know, with your fiduciary responsibility, you oversee the school system and you want to see a comprehensive picture of how children are doing so that you can act in their best interest and on behalf of parents. Um, last week's presentation that I saw about NCAP and coming from the system, having worked with the superintendent, I'm used to being frank, I was not at all um, let, let's say, enthralled with that presentation from a board member perspective. I'm going to tell you why. Those who, con Santiana said, those who ignore the past are condemned to repeat it. I have two presentations here. One is an authentic presentation that was given about a program, language, exclamation point, that over time had over 19,000 children participating, and at any point in time in enrollment, there were 57,000 children. It cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. The original presentation that was written shows that those children were doing worse. 90, at one point entering the program, 50% were at basic. That includes children who had achieved at a high level. When they left the program, when we had it at, the, at this report time, 90% of the children were doing just as bad or worse. Then I have another. One is the actual evaluation, and the second one is one based on another test that came with the program that took three minutes to administer, unlike the first test from the State Department that was the MSA based on state standards. They took an informal test and showed that the program was a success. I think I'm going to leave this for you all to look at. The MCAP scores, that I, I would just say, when you look at cut scores, have someone come to you and speak about the scores, because I kept hearing emphasis on the positive side that, well, when you look at, when you consider scores, we came close to the cut score. Yes, but that means children who succeeded also came close to that cut score, because cut score is a minimum. You should also look at the median, not the mean, which is influenced by high and low. What I'm saying is in this time, you need a comprehensive presentation from staff and it is their responsibility to give it to you and if they can't I'm representing the NAACP I will come back and I certainly will I know a little bit about statistics in the school system thank you our next speaker is Adelaide Wallstrom Did I say your name right? Okay, good, good. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Adelaide Volstrom. I'm a fifth grade student from Hampton Elementary School. I know you've heard a lot about the overcrowding of our school. I know this because my mom talked in January. I listened in. So I'm here to give you a first-hand account, uh, a first-hand experience of what an overcrowded school is like. But from my perspective, a student. There's a total of 814 students at my school. <coughs> I've been told that the school is made for 670 students. The board has been told this multiple times through email, call, in person, and at these board meetings. Right now, we have 144 extra students. I'm not saying it's bad to have extra students, but so many kids at one school impacts everyone. I want to share some examples. In my advanced math class with a teacher that I love, we have so many smart students that we don't have enough desks. It's loud and overcrowded, and it makes learning harder than it should be. And it's advanced math. But really, it's a difficult, in my opinion, unacceptable learning space. Hampton is full of great teachers and classes. We're lucky to have special area classes. 
But, for example, they're so full that on Fridays, two fifth grade classes have to split PE time. Um, one class is in the STEM room and the other is in the gym. Halfway, oh my gosh, halfway through the period, they switch rooms. This is unfair because all the other fifth grade classes get a whole period in the gym. Let me tell you that when you're in the STEM room, it's way different from the gym. Also, my class, which has 28 students, there isn't enough room for everyone to get up, refresh, and have a movement break without bumping into one another. This happens at indoor recess because it's so crowded and noisy. Actually, the noise isn't bad in the classroom. It's bad in the lunchroom. Oh, and in the hallways during the morning and afternoon. Not to mention how cramped it is to walk to the hallways during these rush hour times. I love Hampton. I love all the teachers at Hampton, and my teachers are the best. I love our amazing principal and our vice principal too. However, I'm sure they probably have a difficult time teaching when it gets loud because of all the students. I imagine it's hard to focus on what you're teaching when you're in charge of a lot of kids that sometimes distract and disrupt the class. I have heard that some schools are undercrowded. This is unfair because I believe everyone deserves a healthy and fair learning environment. I know I'm going off to middle school, so why do I care? Well, I have two little sisters that are still going to Hampton, but it isn't just about them. It's about everyone. School shouldn't be overcrowded. Like I said, I believe everyone deserves a healthy and fair learning environment. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton. All right, Cindy, you got to file that one. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Elector, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I want to take a moment to thank the appointed members of the board who are, I am quite sure, happy this is their final board meeting. I don't know if this was the experience you imagined when you started this journey, but I do know you weren't expecting to serve an additional four months, but I thank you. We needed a full board to do the work that was done, especially around the budget, and I appreciate the time and effort each of you put forward for that and every other thing that came your way. The new appointees will have you to thank as they take their seats, hopefully very soon, for paving the way during unprecedented and tumultuous times. I hope you all enjoy whatever the next phase of your lives bring you. But now it wouldn't be a Board of Ed meeting if I didn't talk about recruiting and retaining our educators. According to the Maryland State Department of Education, teacher retention in Maryland for the 22-23 school year was the lowest it had been in at least 10 years. That doesn't bode well for our students. Our negotiations with the school system continue, as does the advocacy of TABCO with the county executive and the county council. I continue to hear concerns daily about achievement behavior, special ed, mental health needs, and more. And while I know that money alone cannot solve the complex issues facing us, it can help BCPS climb out of the middle of the pack when it comes to career earnings in Maryland. So again, can we please work together and find a way to be sure that the compensation is there so we can keep the educators we have and attract new ones. Let's do all we can now for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hope Metzler. Good evening, Good evening. Chair and person um, of the board, board members, Superintendent Williams, and um, thank you for your time this evening. I have some good news, that's why I'm here. Um, with the PTA Council of um, Baltimore County, my name is Hope Metzler, and I am the chairperson of the Reflections Program. What is Reflections, you ask me? It is a national PTA uh, program that promotes arts and education. It has two components, which is why they call it a program. The first part is the theme search, which is chosen by students. The second part is the art competition. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about the competition, which is going to lead me to the exciting news, which you have here, if you want to look at this while I tell you about it. So there's four levels of the art competition. It starts at the local level, 
It then goes to the council level, which is my level, and then it goes to the state level, and then it goes to the national level. So in Maryland, um, you know, Free State PTA, there are seven counties that participate. And for the first time, not just in my time, I've been doing this for five years, but for the first time in a very long time that even Jane Lee can remember, um, that Baltimore County has six outstanding interpretation awards, <clears throat> two awards of excellence, and two award of merits. And for the first time ever, we've had two students in the special artist category. And I've really been hoping for this. And we had not only two, but we had two um, uh, do have outstanding um, awards. So I'm very excited. Um, wanted to let you, uh, if you'll look at the congratulations note, you will see um, all the, the different schools that participated this year. And you will also see that six of these kiddos have outstanding interpretation. Now, outstanding interpretation from the state means that these kiddos go to national. So at national, there are 44 states that participate in this fun um, art competition. And our kiddos are going to be um, there for judging at national. I'm very excited. The news will come out um, May the 1st, so we will find out then if maybe if any of our um, kids won at national. And if they do, there's a monetary prize, which is always exciting for students. There's a gorgeous certificate, and their artwork goes on um, display and goes around the country for, uh, you know, display in, in various places around the states. So um, I wanted to thank Miss Christina for helping at our um, um, our award ceremony. <laughs> well, thank you. Our next speaker is Quiana Cook Bradford. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is uh, Kiana Cook. Good evening, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and Superintendent Dr. Williams. I am Kiana Cook Bradford, a member of the Baltimore County branch of NAACP and a member of the, their Education Committee. I was tasked with an easy job today except for keeping to the three minutes. I would like to come, first of all, to thank Dr. Williams for his constant support of the AXO program. For those of you who don't know what AXO means, it's the Academic, Cultural, Technolo Technological, Scientific Olympics program. We are now preparing the students for this competition, which will be held on April the 29th at the Newtown High School. We are inviting all of you to attend this competition. It is a wonderful opportunity to see your fantastic, talented students. We have so many dynamic, talented, innovative students from Baltimore County Public Schools participating and who have participated in the past. The AXO program has allowed kids to compete on a national stage and we have claimed many medals, silver as well as many golds. We have started this, we will start this program next week, well on the 29th at 9 a.m. and end at 3. We sincerely hope that you can attend. We also would like to take this time to once again thank Dr. Williams for his faith in our students and the AXO program and for a chance to show the nation how great our kids are in spite of the media. Dr. Williams had the vision for Baltimore County Public Schools. He was wet, met with many challenges that one could hardly imagine. He had to deal with the cyber attack which, hand, which he handled with dignity and respect for everyone. No one could foresee this type of virus which invaded the district. Then he had the huge challenge of COVID, another virus, affecting children and adults, and it closed our school. I'm not going to say how old I am, but I've never seen the school system, the entire system, close up for a virus. Uh, first time in my lifetime. We've had to adjust instruction, 
we've had to adjust learning and working in Baltimore City. We, real we realized that nobody could have predicted this universal world emergency. But Dr. Williams, we thank you for the job that you did. We thank you for, supporting, for, su for the support you gave our children, parents, and staff. Your main concern was keeping our children safe and providing an education in the midst of an unusual universal crisis. We thank you for that. We were able to continue our AXO program, and for that, we will be forever grateful. We thank you, and we would, we would like to be in support of you as you transition to your new life. Thank you very much. And I did it with one minute left. You did. Thank you. <laughs> one second left. <laughs> Woohoo! Our next speaker um, is starting public comments, and that is Katie James. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, members of the board and all key stakeholders um, involved in our learning of students in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, I am a former BCPS employee and a parent to a student at Hampton Elementary School. Um, and I am here to piggyback on what has already been said, but really it comes down to safety as well. We teach that as one of the first fundamentals to students to be safe, but yet we're not modeling that. BCPS is not modeling that. There is a maximum capacity that the fire marshal puts for each building, each school building. Um, if you went out to a restaurant, there's a max capacity. If you went to a movie theater, if you went to a venue, those are there so that everybody can exit that building in a safe manner that is calculated by the fire marshal. Every school has those. And right now, Hampton Elementary School is out of compliance because they are over the max capacity in the gymnasium specifically and in the cafeteria. The cafeteria is for 300 students. So if learning cottages, AKA trailers, were brought in to solve and uh, alleviate this problem, it is also creating another safety problem by students having to walk to these trailers. They're not gonna, the cafeteria, the food is not going to be made in these trailers, so they're going to have to come back into the cafeteria to eat, or the food's going to have to be taken out to the trailers. So that is not a long-term solution. Um, we are very much uh, anticipating what will be coming out in this next week to alleviate this, but the learning cottages is not a long-term solution. So I encourage all of the members and key stakeholders um, involved in the boundary study and the overcrowding to do the right thing and lead by example, um, which is being safe. And we know in 2023 that we, that there are people out there that are capable of hurting our children. So our educators and the people that support us can prevent anything further from happening by being in compliance um, with the maximum capacity of those students so that they could exit the building if need be an emergency situation. Thank you for your time. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Warstrom. I think this may be the famous mother of the previous speaker. Good evening. Good evening, yes, I was going to say I'm the <laughs> luckiest person in this room because I am the pr very proud mother of that brave 10-year-old uh, girl who got up here and spoke her words um, to you. So yeah, sorry, fills me with tears because she uh, is very passionate as you are well aware, so are a lot of the people, I would say all of the, pe the community at Hampton Elementary. We have emailed you, we've called you, we've been here in person. I feel like I could recite, you could probably recite it with me. We could say it all together. Um, it's time for you to like at our school and talk to us. Thank you so much. I know you all have done a lot and read our things and heard us. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Hampton and tell you a little bit about how hard our teachers are working. Um, did you know that that awesome little girl who was just up here was Ursula at the elementary school's uh, Little Mermaid production that they just put on? It was amazing, she did a great job. Uh, since September, four teachers have volunteered their time and their energy every Tuesday and Thursday until March, the performance was in March, uh, till 5.45. 
with 50 plus uh, students, cast and crew. And it was amazing and it turned out great. But because our auditorium only fits 300 kids or 300 people, there were sold out shows. They, they did it four times, they could have done it 10 times and not everyone who wanted to come would have been able to come. Did you know that we have a Battle of the Books team? They come in the morning, the librarian meets with them on her own time. Uh, we have a chess club, a coding club, a math 24 club, a newspaper club, an art club, each with a teacher advisor who helps run it on their own time in the morning, early, or after school. Every Friday morning, there is a team of students who work with the guidance counselor and the librarian, and they do a video news report for the school. It's very cool. Uh, there's like a green reporter and a sports reporter. Um, all of these teachers are going above and beyond. These opportunities are possible because of their devotion to our students. At a time when we have a national teacher shortage, it is quite frankly unbelievable and outstanding to see teachers who give time like this for their students on top of teaching in classrooms that are, as you know, overcrowded. It feels very unfair and unreasonable that these wonderful people who are willing to open their hearts and give all that they have to our students are being asked to do the impossible and teach in classrooms that are uncomfortable learning environments due to the numbers. No kindergarten teacher should have to teach 25, 28 five-year-olds, but yet that is happening at Hampton. Other schools and middle schools in the area have two to three assistant principals, and Hampton has one, doing all of that work by herself. And she's marvelous. Hampton has an amazing principal who's constantly advocating for her teachers. Um, I know you've heard a lot from us, and I know that trailers or whatever, cottages, are an option, but I think that we need more. We need a long-term solution. And we have a large community, and we're not going away. We are here to advocate for our students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vernon Fisher. Vernon Fisher. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me, um, Dr. Williams Board. I'm here to provide an update on the DMS mentoring program. Uh, as you may recall, we've been mentoring over the past school year, providing workshop sessions of, on topics like self-identification, purpose, budgeting, and etiquette. We talked about etiquette in the classroom as well as in the school, dining etiquette, and we will be focusing on phone etiquette as well as business etiquette. From there, we delved into purpose. We defined it. We identify people with vision and purpose. From there, we started focusing on their purpose, past and present and future. Our budgeting session was of particular interest to me as we discussed the components of a budget and acquiring a job based on education and skill sets. We will continue the discussion under financial literacy called the iGrad program. Finally, we engage in our Room to Read project. I don't know if you heard about it, but 12 mentees that I mentor uh, at Dumbarton Middle School read to kindergarten students age-appropriate books. The mentees, before going over there, fine-tuned their reading skills in preparation for the reading. They took pride in themselves and dressed for the occasion and took a leadership position with the kindergarten students. They engaged in interactive dialogue with the students. And let me add that the 57 kindergarten students that they read to were gifted with a pizza, compliments of your local Domino's pizza, and a brand new book, which was donated by frat brothers, friends, family members, my mother included, and the Baltimore County Public Schools Education Foundation, Ms. Uh, Phelps. I want to close by thanking Dr. Williams for providing us the opportunity to mentor at DMS. Dr. Williams' vision of having the community at large come in and provide a, an additional layer of care and support for the students at BCPS was amazing. Thank you, sir, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Darren Bedillo.
Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening, board and superintendent, Dr. Williams. I'm here this evening on behalf of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition Leadership Team. I'm the Outreach Community Coordinator. We appreciate the discussion at the PRC meeting last week regarding the definition of stakeholder groups in the relation to providing public comment at meetings. We were assured that many of you find value in hearing from cross section of perspectives. And we would like to remind you that the groups that are recognized as stakeholders and guaranteed speaking slots at each of the meetings are special interest groups that have working relationships with the school system and other opportunities to meet with staff to express their needs and negotiate their ask. Regular parents do not have that relationship or direct line of communication. And at the top of the organizational chart, it lists parents, students, and community, not bargaining units, not stakeholder groups. We know that the policy is only related to stakeholder groups and public comment. And we appreciate the dialogue and further definition of stakeholder and how to add and subtract groups from that list. Because stakeholder groups are called upon, for example, most recently to review their cur curriculum and provide feedback on superintendent applicants. We would like the community groups and or groups of regular parents whose only special interest is the success of the children, the opportunity to contribute to the improvement of the school system. Baltimore County Parent Student Coalition is a grassroots group that came together originally when parents felt like they were unable to communicate directly with the school administration. We grew, matured, and have over 5,000 members all over the country. We communicate on a regular basis directly with families looking to understand the system and advocate for their child. We use BCPS resources to accurately educate parents on policies and practices and refer families to the appropriate staff identified in the BCPS organizational chart and refer them to you all as their representatives. We encourage direct inquiries and communication with the appropriate staff. And we understand that many issues facing students and staffs in schools because of our relationships with our members. We would like the opportunity to play a role in the focus groups and bring concerns, ideas, and a willingness to help with the solutions to the table. Our sole priority is the success, our sole priority is the success of the children and the children in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jesse Yeager. Good evening. Hello. Dropping my marbles here. Sometimes we have to learn a little differently. So, in 2020, there was a boundary study that took one overcrowded school and we just used one other overcrowded school. Now when we talk to you guys about that, we're thrown back Rule 1280 about capital improvements and balancing the capacity. I'm not sure that that is balancing. That just looks like moving to me. And there's no capital improvement. There was no capital improvement plan in 2020. We were told it was actually going to be temporary, but we were given no plan about how temporary it would be. And now we're learning there might be a plan. So thank you. You're hearing us. Yay! I can't wait to hear the plan. Forgive me if my smile is not very genuine. I don't feel very trustworthy and what plan could be forthcoming when last week we met with the Central Area Education Advisory Council and the Office of Strategic Planning and Facilities Management and we're told that they have a 98 to 99 percent accuracy for student enrollment projections. Yet when I look at the student count that was released in February for 2022, 
nine out of the 33 central area schools were highlighted in red, which meant that there was over a 7% difference. I don't think that equals 98 to 99% accuracy. So please, in this plan, make sure you reevaluate how you're counting students and not just accepting September 30th as the full-time enrollment for a school for a full school year. Because Hampton has added, I don't know, maybe, what, 80 students over the projection from the projection to now based on past September 30th because we've added way more students after September 30th at Hampton. So what's the plan? I can't wait to hear about it. I really hope you're not gonna kick the can down the road like before. And I would show you how to even out the marbles, but I'm kind of tired of losing my marbles. So thank you. Next, our next speaker is Yara Shaikh. Oh, Yara. Yara Shaikh? Nope. Our next speaker is Meg O'Hara. Actually, it's Meg O'Hare. Uh, Meg O'Hare, I'm sorry. Hard to remember people's names, I know, even if they serve on the board. Good evening, Ms. O'Hare. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address the board. I brought you uh, something that I actually came across this week, which were the 12 year of success of Dr. Joe Hairston. I only bring it not to say ha 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 ha, but I think it would be worthwhile seeing where the school system was 12 years ago. So this is kind of like a 24 year retrospective, success versus not success. To understand where Baltimore County public school system should go, we need to look back to the time when BCPS was a model of success. I brought the handout. Dr. Hairston pointed us in the right direction, and had BCPS continued on that path, it would not be facing the crisis we face today, COVID or no COVID. Lots of school systems faced COVID, but they didn't face what we faced in decline. In years past, BCPS had been known nationwide for its curriculum. BCPS curriculum was used by school systems and universities across the nation, both in the classroom and for teacher training. To keep BCPS curriculum cutting edge, after an extensive curriculum audit by Phi Delta Kappa, you might want to look at the Phi Delta Kappa report, Dr. Harrison was one of the first superintendents in the nation to digitize curriculum. That curriculum was accessible to parents, and the public on the BCPS website. Where did it go? All of this that I'm telling you is documented, or it should be. As late as 2010, BCPS was implementing a multi-dimensional instructional planning and assessment tool unique to Baltimore County. In fact, Dr. Lorian, then Dean of Education at Towson University, called the program's curriculum component a valuable and necessary tool which provides an efficient web-based presentation of the Maryland State curriculum in a form that is helpful to teachers, especially those recently certified or hired by BCPS from outside of Maryland. It's unfathomable that 12 years ago, the board, whose primary responsibility is hiring and assessing the performance of the BCPS superintendent, did not reappoint Dr. Harrison despite his proven track record. Instead, that board hired a new superintendent who stated early on that his leadership style was building the airplane while in flight. Well, 12 years later, BCPS is heading for a crash landing. Sadly now, BCPS parents, children, especially poor and minority students, and many BCPS teachers are the victims of this poor leadership. To make all this worse, pre precious resources are being wasted on BCPS central office salaries and their slapdash solutions instead of being sent on students in school buildings. The top heavy central office structure has directors directing directors. When will this all stop? I'm asking the board to do its job and hire a superintendent capable of restoring BCPS to its former status as a cutting edge school system focused on student achievement. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Bash Farone. Good evening to all. Good evening. I did attend the McPherson search event in Carver School on 319. 2023, and there were about 20 people in attendance. 10 were TAPCO members, and the other 10 are parents or maybe residents like myself. There was no one from the Central Area Educational Advisory Council. There was no coordinator, and I am concerned about that. Some history might be of benefit for you. In the 90s, past boards appointed a rough superintendent. It was difficult. Then a good superintendent came in, Dr. Hirston, you already uh, heard about him, a gentleman, educator, but he was the status quo. So when he finished his term, the board appointed Dr. Dance. He was charismatic and very smart, but did the wrong things, and he paid for them. Then came, and that's my subject, is Dr. Verlita White. She's our own. And the board let her go for political reasons and not for qualifications. Now she's in Virginia. She's flourishing. She's attracting attention, not only in the state of Virginia, but also in a national level. Why do I say this? So my screen shut off. I forgot what I'm going to say. Um, I hope you would consider appointing a local person than import somebody from outside our system. I hope you would consider that. I think the board, the past board, made a grave mistake by letting Verlita White go. People need to go for a good reason and not for political reason. Anyhow, the new superintendent needs to have special skills. You already know them. The one I think is most pertinent is to be able to deal with the politics of the county and the state. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Politics started with Adam and Eve and their kids. It's really the natural thing. But whoever person comes in needs to be able to transcend those politics. Last, one reason we have a student member is really for all of you to remember that it is all about the kids. It's all about the kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kenneth Benjis. Kenneth. Good evening, ben board, and thank you for your time. I'm Ken Benjis, BCPS teacher and alumni. I graduated from Eastern Tech with a bunch of people who became teachers, and every year I see more of them, more and more of them quitting. Everyone that I graduated with from St. Mary's, who was teaching in Baltimore County, has quit or left for another county. I'm not sure what you're hearing from BCPS, but there are a lot of people jumping ship. Some are leaving education entirely, and many others are heading out to competing counties that simply offer more money. I'm here tonight to ask you to agree to funding the salary scale reform. I've had numerous people come up to me in the past month asking questions about how to go about resigning, which really sucks. There are still hundreds of unfilled positions in the county, and I can only imagine it's going to get worse. Please treat us with respect, with dignity, and pay us what we're worth. We're sick of begging every year for the bare minimum to keep our schools fully staffed. I want to reiterate what TABCO President Cindy Sexton said. Retention is down across the board, not just here, but throughout all of Maryland. We need to do something to attract and keep our amazing educators. And one of the most immediate actions you, can, you as a board can take is to fully fund our request for salary scale adjustment. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Barnett.
Good evening. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Good. I'm uh, Aaron Barnett, and I'm the director of Our Block, which is a local mentoring program for young people in Baltimore County. First, I'd like to start off by saying uh, greetings to each and every one of you. Uh, Dr. Williams, I know that you know I've heard various opinions about your tenure, but I will say this, you were definitely handed a hot potato and you handled it pretty well. And I think that, you know, your, your successor knows that they're gonna, hopefully they know they're gonna be getting a hot potato as well. But my um, purpose here this evening is to talk about the need for collaboration between BCPS and local mentoring programs to ensure that the kids, I know that you all watch the news every day and you can see that a lot of our children, as a matter of fact, a couple of the children that were murdered recently in Baltimore City were, uh, members of the Woodlawn community. Uh, a couple of them, I'm also, I'm also Vice President of Reckon Parks in the Woodlawn area, and so a couple of those kids were in our football and basketball programs, sad to say. But there's a desperate need for mentoring programs in Baltimore County, and we know that in, in conjunction with the school system, uh, the state's attorney's office, Baltimore County Police, you know, I've worked uh, diligently with a lot of these agencies, but we know that you can have 100 programs and it's still not enough. You know, our children are desperately in need of successful programs. I've been in operation since 2008. I've worked with uh, your predecessors, Dr. Dance, uh, Valletta, Joe Harrison, um, the Count, uh, Scott Schellenberger, state's attorney, and uh, various people in the community uh, wear many hats in that Woodlawn area. And so I just wanted to come out and just uh, solicit the support of the Baltimore County um, um, School Board to get more actively engaged with um, collaboration with uh, local mentoring programs that are in the area. And so I left a few, I have a few of my uh, older brochures. Our program is currently uh, brochures under reconstruction and uh, websites under reconstruction momentarily, but I just wanted to leave some of these with you for the board members and that could basically tell you what our program is all about. I thank you for your attention but uh, and I thank you for all that you're trying to do to service the students in Baltimore County and collectively I think we can just rise to the occasion. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Since we had one speaker that um, isn't present we will go to the waiting list so the next speaker is Robin Campbell. Oh, she, is Robin, Ms. Campbell here? He, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, he was standing in the back, wasn't he? Okay, so he's not, no longer here. The next speaker is Jen Reedham. Good evening. Good evening, give me one second. Get That's to okay. Me. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Um, congratulations to all that are new on the board. I haven't been here since you all are on, have been appointed or, or um, elected. Um, I just finished the podcast called Sold a Story, and if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend it. During the episodes, I found similarities to my own child's journey and others in BCPS. The failure from the school system sent him into as a struggling reader. It makes me so mad all the wasted years not giving my son the supports he needs to be a fluid and proficient reader. I'll never forget when elementary school that he attended gave him a reading assessment in fifth grade. I was very angry at the time because it was against everything I was taught in my college teaching reading classes when studying to become an elementary school teacher. The reading specialist and special educator during our IEP meetings were trying to say my son could read on grade level, but they gave him a test with three and four letter words in fifth grade. When the picture books started to disappear around fourth and fifth grade, that's when he started to fall apart because he couldn't get the answers from the pictures because he couldn't read. He was taught to look at pictures for context, context instead of reading the actual words and understanding the vocabulary instead of understanding the vocabulary of what he was reading, but he wasn't reading. He was absolutely frustrated and started acting up. 
He would rip up his papers and throw them on the floor, and that's when the work refusal issue started. I knew the function of the behavior was exactly from improper reading strategies that were never taught to him. This was fifth grade, and all of the early, inter reading, early reading interventions were missed. Then during the pandemic, I found out he was put into a reading class with the wrong reading interventions. Another three years wasted. He could have been on a completely different trajectory, but instead he felt defeated because for so long, he didn't trust the school system to teach him how to read. Reading is basic. I send my kids to school to learn how to read over any other thing. And my kid can't read, he's in 10th grade. BCPS would call him a striving reader, but he's a struggling reader. He can read, but not very well, definitely not fluidly. Um, at the end of the Sold a Story podcast, there was a re-release from the podcast called Hard to Read, and there's a current BCPS staff member who's featured in the episode that was aired in 2017, and yet reading proficiency scores continue to decline since that interview six years ago. If there's such an importance and urgency to improve the reading programs in BCPS, BCPS needs to seriously reevaluate those in roles who have direct correlation to academic proficiency and find better people. In what field are you able to fail at your job and still keep it? Thank you. Next is public comment on board policies. Our first is board policy 3128, board owned vehicles. And I call on Dr. Frone. We are doing one by one, right? Yes, but you'll be able to stay in the seat. Good evening to all. Please consider. The first policy is 3128, um, line 13 to 15. It's about using vehicles utilized for business purposes only. Suggest using the word BCPS related business instead of just saying business. Line 14 specifically authorized in advance or in accordance with the employment contract. Suggest replacing it with spe specifically authorized by the superintendent or designee. Line 17 and 18 talks about the driver should be required to participate in a driver training program. It doesn't say what kind. So just that you would say participate in a Maryland state government approved driver training program. Line 20 and 21 talks about the use of there for the superintendent to be inclusive instead of her and his. And I am a foreigner, as you know. Uh, there is a plural, and the superintendent is singular. So personally, I find there is a conflict between the two. So I suggest that you would use something like the superintendent or staff, comma, or their designee. This way, grammar-wise, it becomes plural on both sides. Just a thought in 58 seconds. I believe this policy is brief. I think there should be a reference that the driver should comply with the state and federal laws and to be responsible for tickets and other violations of the law. Um, driver should not really use it for personal reasons unless it is for emergency and should be responsible for any uh, alteration or wanton damage. In other words, what I'm saying, the policy needs to protect the assets of the school system and not be so brief. And that's the end of my remarks on this policy. 
Next is Board Policy 3170, Performance Management System for Continuous Improvement, renamed Framework for Continuous Improvement. That's me. That's you. Okay. Hit it. Um, line number nine and 10 says, belief is further evidenced by establishing clear standards and expectations. And I really appreciate PRC and the board for using the, the statement clear standards. Um, policies in general over my past 20 plus years are not specific many times or too brief. Line 14 and 15, management system for continuous improvement will improve the involvement of principals, etc. Um, in my opinion, improvement is like rubber. It's stretchable. It needs to be really defined. Everything in the school system, I believe, should be measured. Line 23 talks about adding framework. However, dictionary says that framework means system. So, you know, whether we use the word system or framework, it is the same. And if we replace one with the other, we haven't really done anything. And if we kept both of them, it's redundant. Line number 29. Um, line number 29 says, monitors, monitors performance and reports to the board at least semi-annually. That's talking about the superintendent. I personally believe watching the board for more than two decades, that semi-annually is too infrequent. And I made that observation many times in the past. I recommend that is done quarterly. This policy is vital in my opinion and should be more detailed, more elaborate, and more clear. That's the end of my remarks about this policy. Thank you. Next is Board Policy 4005, Tutoring and Educational Services. Dr. Ferrone. This policy talks about conflict of interest. Line 12 uses the word, board prohibits employees from benefiting from business, etc. And then in line 14, it uses the word relationship with students. In the analysis of the policy, the policy talks about potential, potential conflict of interest. However, if we analyze it and we talk about potential conflict of interest, but then we prohibit, I think there is a conflict in that because prohibition is definite. You, you just don't allow anything. Potential conflict of interest, you know, you may allow, you may not. I have a thought about this. If a student or a parent of a student wants BCPS teacher to do after our extra teaching or in Saturday or Sunday or holidays, I believe this would be better for the student and the teacher in the same time and most of the times. Because the teacher knows the student, the student knows the teacher, the parents are aware and approving. So I do not see really where this word prohibition that is so drastic and radical comes in. The student is not going to be better off by going to an Anne Arundel County teacher to have tutoring effect. And I really wish that the board will consider this thought. Um, I think the point of that is transparency. If it is known to the school system and to the parents, then there is no harm in it. Conflict of interest, which is written here, talks about whatever effect could compromise his or her judgment. And to me, a teacher who knows the student and vice versa, um, and the parents are aware, not 
that is not really going to be a negative thing. It would be a positive thing. Plus, it really deprive our teachers from a source of income after hours, kind of like moonlighting for residents and doctors kind of a thing, um, and force them to have a second career somewhere else. I just don't see the point in that. And thank you. That's my comment about this policy. And then the last policy is 5230, student records. Dr. Ferron. This is really an important policy. If you look at lines six and seven, parents have the right to inspect and review their child's student records, and I think they can correct it. So I am really concerned that the parent has only these three things, inspect, um, review and correct. I think parents should have ability to have a copy of the records free of charge because the parents are the ones who own the records of the student, even though that the school system is the custodian. Just like in a hospital, if you go and have surgery, you own that medical record, you know? And I don't see really a, a, a benefit for the school system to make parents just come and inspect, which is cumbersome. They might be busy or just really correct things, but not really being able to have a copy of it for any future reference, let alone if they are charged by the school system per page, et cetera, which is also cumbersome. I think this policy is too brief in relation to the importance of that issue. And as you know, I'm not really an educator like many of you are, but I think it needs to be discussed in, in depth. Um, I might have some other ideas for you, but for the time being, uh, I think it's just too brief. It's really briefer than a telegram for an important subject like the records of students. And thank you, that's the end of my remarks. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 3128, Non-Instructional Services, Board-Owned Vehicles. Board Policy 3170, Non-Instructional Services, Performance Management System for Continuous Improvement, Renamed Framework for Continuous Improvement. Board Policy 4005, Personnel, Tutoring, Educational Services. Board Policy 5230, Students, Promotion and Retention, Student Records. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the, board policy, the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3128, 3170, 4005, and 5230? So moved, Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Bersades. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the 2022-2023 second quarter results. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Zarchin. Good evening. Good evening. 
Good evening. So good evening again, um, Dr. Williams, Chair Lecter, members of the, the board. I'm Dr. McComas, Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Dr. Zarchin, our Chief of Schools. Next slide, please. Can we continue to pri prioritize our focus on areas, uh, focus areas this academic year. To support our students in the learning process, we use student data to inform instructional decisions. We monitor multiple indicators of progress such as student work samples, unit tests, and performance assessments. We also respond to student skills and knowledge by providing opportunities for reinforcement and enrichment through small group instruction. As a community, we are committed to monitoring and discussing our, in our schools and here in open session, student performance and data informed decision making. We recognize data as a flashlight and look forward to expanding our vision and understanding our students when taken in context. Next slide, please. The COMPASS uh, guides us to increase student achievement for all students while preparing them for a variety of pathways to become college and career ready over the course of their time with us. This evening, we will focus on two aspects of the COMPASS, learning accountability and results and safe and supportive school environments. And most specifically, we will address attendance uh, student belonging and outcomes, um, course outcomes for the second marking period. Next slide, please. Promoting high attendance rates for all students is an important part of growth and achievement over time. While we're grateful that the pandemic continues to subside this school year, we have experienced a variety of seasonal illnesses that have impacted student attendance and combined to add precaution towards sending students to school with symptoms. In addition to the physical illness that students and staff have contended with, we believe that the lingering effects of trauma are continuing to impact both students and staff. This part of our pre presentation will focus on student attendance. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> Regular attendance, we all know, is critical for student success, and yet we see in our second quarter that uh, our families and our students um, exhibited some challenges to demonstrating strong attendance. While typically we do see second quarter is impacted by winter colds, our BCPS health team of nurses have indicated that during second quarter, uh, we saw parents exercise increased precaution when deciding uh, to send their child either to school or, or to keep them at home if they were exhibiting cold-like symptoms. Additionally, we saw a commingling of um, COVID, flu, and RSV as reasons for students to be out of school. This did result in higher than normal absences due to student to illnesses. We saw similar bumps um, in absences during the 2009-2010 uh, school year because of the H1N1. Additionally, our PPWs are doing, uh, we're doing many things urgently to address the attendance during second quarter. Our PPWs worked with each school team's attendance committee to identify those students who were chronically absent and to um, apply interventions. Specifically, students that receive tier one interventions, our PPWs work with schools to bring awareness to the benefits of positive school attendance, and they su also support recognizing and incentivizing attendance. For students who need a, layer, a tier two level of intervention, our PPWs met with groups of secondary students to stress the importance of regular attendance, and they provide students with a letter to take home and a list of resources that may help to eliminate barriers for students and families uh, ensuring that their students can attend school. We'll talk about level three in the next slide. School attendance teams are an important part of the work in schools. They monitor attendance and identify actions as needed. Actions include proactive strategies as well as interventions. Interventions begin with calls home to parents and caregivers to understand what are the challenges that are being faced and then helping students attend more regularly. Although we have moved away from perfect attendance recognition, schools are working to creatively monitor and celebrate increased attendance in school. Overall, we recognize that student engagement, both in the classroom and in extracurricular activities, are important to ensure that students are well connected to schools in meaningful ways. 
Next slide, please. A student is considered chronically absent when their attendance rate reaches or falls below 90%. This does include both excused and unexcused absences. Many of our pupil personnel workers report following factors uh, that contribute to the increase in chronic absenteeism. One, as mentioned previously, we are seeing families exercise heightened precaution when students exhibit symptoms and um, kept students home more readily. Additionally, we're, we're recognizing a change or an altered perception of what constitutes attendance. Uh, as, as many assignments can be accessed uh, virtually or electronically, completed and submitted online, our PPWs are working and talking with families about the importance of being present in school and that accessing work through the learning management system alone does not constitute attendance. So we've been working hard on adjusting mindsets following the disruption of the last couple years. Additionally, our PPWs are urgently applying tier three interventions. Uh, some things that uh, included in tier three interventions are making home visits, referring families to Project Attend, leveraging legal protocols for noncompliance with compulsory attendance laws where necessary. Multi-tiered systems of support address student engagement and attendance in the schoolhouse in a variety of ways. As mentioned previously, student attendance teams monitor students struggling with regular attendance and partner with parents and caregivers to improve the student's attendance. These supports increase with intensity, leveraging the PPW up to and including court action when appropriate. Next slide, please. Throughout this evening's presentation, I will also highlight data from our virtual learning program, referred to as VLP. The VLP, as all of you know, is in its second year and currently serves over 1,000 students um, in grades one through 12. And we recognize that it is only a fraction of our overall student enrollment. Students are concerned to be present for their VLP classes if they log into their synchronous Google Meet class session with their teachers. Every level of the VLP, elementary, middle, and high, did experience uh, attendance growth uh, when comparing marking period one to marking period two. It is also noted that the elementary and middle school levels of VLP have met the 94% district target. And for the high school VLP, uh, we, we reached 90.5%. Our VLP faculty and administration do follow the same protocols and approaches to proactive um, engagement and interventions as our traditional schools follow as well. Next slide. The past four years, Dr. Williams has led with the charge to ensure that each student has an adult advocate in the schools. This work has become even more important as we continue to address the lingering social, emotional, well-being concerns that were elevated as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Last quarter, we shared student belonging data from our annual stakeholder climate survey. And our stakeholder climate survey for this school year just closed on Friday, March 3rd, 2023. And from this, we will calculate updated student belonging data, which will be available in future presentations. Uh, overall, we do want to let you know that um, to support our students in developing a sense of belonging, we use the CASEL framework, which is a process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage their emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. Additionally, uh, as Dr. Zarchin has mentioned, we use a multi-tiered system of support for students paired with a student support team process. We additionally engage students in a Mind Over Matters campaign where they focus on activities that support awareness of social, emotional, mental, and physical wellness. And we proactively engage students in a six-year planning process with our school counselors to help them chart out a vision for their future as they move through uh, BCPS and on to uh, college and career readiness. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of student suspensions, there are some patterns over time for us to consider. Suspension rates are typically lowest in the first and fourth marking periods and greatest during the second and third marking periods. Systemically, we use a framework of prevention, intervention, consequences, and restoration to address misbehavior. While our goal is to keep students in school and engaged in learning, it is necessary to suspend students who dis demonstrate disruptive or dangerous behaviors. 
also when students cause major incidents as outlined in our student handbook. School teams work with central office staff to identify appropriate consequences while putting into action preventative and restorative practices. The safety of every student and staff member is our priority and of the greatest importance of our daily work. The table shown in blue displays this suspension rate for the first and second marking period of this school year by grade level. Overall, student suspension rates for second marking period are similar to the suspension rate shown for the first marking period with a slight increase in specific grade levels. Prior data analysis by marking period and from year to year indicates that suspension rates are typical for students who are in their transition years, that's grades six and nine. The graph shows a comparison of the second marking period suspension rates for 2021 to 22 and 2022 to 23 school years. The suspension rates for students in grade five, six, nine, and 11 are slightly greater for marking period two in 2022-23 compared to the marking period two suspension rate in the previous school year. Next slide, please. We recognize the importance of building a strong sense of belonging among our students and a climate in which our schools are safe places for our students to learn, grow, and to thrive. To that end, we have the following system structures in place. As all of you know, we have our safety assistance. We have mentoring programs. We have after school programs, climate committees, additional support from our pupil personnel workers, our social workers, our social emotional learning teachers, and high levels of wraparound supports for students who benefit the most from, it, from additional resources. Across our schools, we offer a wide range of extracurricular activities based on student interest, such as robotics, theater, band, orchestra, and chorus, just to name a few. As you know, we have a strong athletics program at both the middle and high school levels. We also want to note that our allied sports program for students with special needs is getting stronger every year, and we're very proud of that. We know the more a student is positively engaged in the school community, the more likely they will thrive socially, emotionally, and academically. Next slide, please. In addition to attendance and student belonging, we progress monitor student course grades. The next sec section of this evening's presentation will focus on course performance for the second quarter. Next slide, please. As a community, we routinely monitor multiple data points as illustrated on the screen, and we specifically review quarterly grades as leading data points throughout the year. In the next several slides, we will review course grades by grade levels and subject areas. It's important to recognize that with each quarter, the rigor of skills and knowledge builds upon the previous units of study as students work across the entire year to master the grade level standards and content um, standards. Each school has a student support team in addition to intervention programs and supports. Um, and where designate, um, some schools have the additional community schools resources to help children. Next slide, please. The chart shows the percentage of students earning grades of C or better for our children in grades four and five for the four core content areas of English language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. We see rates of elementary students earning a C or better in English language arts and mathematics were over 87% and over 93% for students in social science and social studies. Systemically, we provide diagnostic assessments at the beginning of each unit for teachers to use to identify uh, where students may have um, gaps or also where they may be um, ahead of the game. We also uh, systemically provide academic interventions and social, emotional, and behavior su supports, as mentioned earlier. This school year, the instructional core team efforts have been a critical part of our work. The instructional core team is a collaborative partnership between central office leaders, school administration, and teachers, where classroom observations and re reflective discussions identify instructional themes to identify areas to focus on as we look to build instructional practices. This involves professional development on a regular basis based on the trends that we see through those observations. 
Instructional core team classroom observations are collaborative and they identify themes that provide a, a map for the professional development throughout the school year. In elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, staff, school administrators, and central office leaders are monitoring student performance and participation in cor course pathways that support success in college and career. Next slide, please. The middle school course grade distribution and the percentage of students earning grades of C or better are displayed for marking period two. To support our middle school achievements, systemically we engage students in the six-year planning process that begins in middle school with our school counseling program. Additionally, as previously mentioned at the beginning of each unit, our teachers have access to diagnostic materials to help identify uh, strengths and needs of our students going into each unit. This data should um, support our teachers in driving small group instruction. Additionally, we have interventions and enrichments available for teachers and school teams to um, match to student needs um, based on diagnostics and student performance throughout a unit. This school year, our middle school executive directors have led the responsive middle school professional development program. Here we use research-based uh, practices that are grounded in best practices correlating with increases in achievement. The instructional core team, classroom observations, and collaborative work to identify those instructional themes I mentioned earlier are also a, a critical part of middle school professional development and how we improve teaching and learning on a regular basis. Next slide, please. The high school course grade distribution chart and a percentage of students earning grades C or better are displayed for marking period two. To support our high school students systemically, we um, support schools through data, literacy, uh, professional learning to help our, our teachers and our school leaders uh, leverage the data they have access to routinely. We monitor on track for graduation and we send home uh, written communication to parents of their student progress towards graduation requirements. And again, uh, as previously mentioned, we have a menu of academic interventions and social emotional behavioral supports. And additionally, uh, throughout the high school years, we work with students in project graduation to keep them on track as they're working towards um, graduation requirements. As we do in elementary and middle school, the instructional core teams have played a, a, an important role in high school. The graduation uh, monitoring is also important as we look at short and long-term planning for our students and teaching focus areas for success in college and career. Next slide, please. The charts before you illustrate our VLP second quarter course performance, and overall we see growth and stability in student success in the VLP. As noted previously, VLP serves an overall small percentage of our student population. VLP does utilize the same uh, response protocols as traditional in-person schools do when we see students are struggling either with attendance or with course performance. Next slide. The VLP high school students earning grades C or better are displayed for marking period two and reflect the challenges during second quarter. The VLP continues to explore ways to further support students, particularly those who are placed in VLP as an alternative placement. Our VLP staff continues to monitor student performance and conduct conferences with families to connect students and families with the resources and supports, just as we would with in-person learning. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about the role of staff in schools. We also understand the importance of the partnership with parents and caregivers when it comes right down to student success. To that end, we encourage our parents and caregivers to check Schoology routinely and talk with students about how they're progressing. Check with teachers regarding progress and utilize the parent university resources. Before we close the presentation, we would like to share the progress, academic achievement reports that we have had and will have as we move forward through the year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions or comments? Ms. Harvey. Uh, thank you for this information. I just have uh, a, a few questions. Uh, one is, you said that there is an ad adult advocate in the schools for each student. 
and each student is aware of who their advocate is? No. no. So How that, does this that work? is a goal that, that Dr. <laughs> Williams um, really challenged us to do in schools, and that adult advocate can be any staff member. What we want to ensure is that if you can picture a student coming off the bus or walking into school, getting out of a car, we want to make sure that they are, they're known, they're greeted by name, and welcome into the learning environment. With that, the framework and foundation for success is set. As, as easy as that sounds, it, that has been a, a challenge. It, it's a challenge because we've got students who are entering the building with all kinds of things going on <coughs> in their lives. So it, we don't specifically call a person out to work with an indi individual students, although some schools have come up with ways <coughs> to try to make sure that every student has a connection with an adult in the building. It, it's really a challenge that Dr. Williams gave all schools to make sure that no one walks into that building feeling like they're alone, they're isolated, and they're not welcome to the schoolhouse. So am I understanding you correctly to mean that every school has adult advocates in the school, but there's not necessarily uh, each student has, can say, you know, Dr. Williams is my advocate, Dr. McComas is my advocate? No, the students wouldn't necessarily know who. Okay. So it, it's, we want to make sure that everyone in the school, from teacher, building service worker, administrator, cafeteria worker, un understands the importance of those connections. That's the charge. Okay. Some, it, sometimes it's done more formally than others. If I may I just add uh, to Dr. Zarchin's point around how we're all called, I will say, um, and, and going, if I may expand a little bit on our middle school, responsive middle school work, uh, that is really following the research of the National Middle School Association um, around middle years learners. Um, and one of the pieces of that is advisory. And so I guess I, I would like to offer that uh, to Dr. Zarchin's point, while we are all, everyone called to be an advocate for students and certainly all people in a school building develop certain relationships with students. Uh, it's um, unavoidable and it's part of what keeps us coming back every day um, are those meaningful relationships. There are, there, schools have different systems and structures to manage that. So to your point, uh, to have a student know who is my person that I go to um, and who's that person who checks in on me? This says, Mary, you know, I can tell something's not right. What's going on and what is it we need to do? Our responsive middle school work uh, really talks around advisory. And again, each middle school principal and their teacher leadership team is uh, crafting out what that is in their building. Uh, some buildings may do that as sort of an extended homeroom. Some students, uh, some buildings do it where uh, students have time to go to, um, I don't want to say like a club, but they're identified uh, by common interest uh, and so that can take many different forms um, and so I just wanted to expand on that thank you you're welcome okay. and my second question is you mentioned uh, with the suspension data that we know that suspensions typically increase in the second and third marking periods yeah. so how are our strategies our strategies modified for those marking periods if we know that the rates typically increase during those marking periods. And do we have any data or information, qualitative or quantitative, that tells us why second and third marking periods see an increase? Well, I will talk, I'll speak anecdotally. Uh, so often it is pretty common that as we go into third quarter, right, right in that February, late January, February time period when we're ending second quarter, uh, schools often do a reset. It's time to reestablish those routines and procedures with students that begin to slide as the school year moves on. Additionally, some schools do uh, change schedules, uh, which resets as well. So that's one of the sort of baked in um, adjustments that we make every year in that, that time of year. For anyone who's been a classroom teacher, you do need to reduce seating plans. You do need to go over st with students' expectations to kind of remind everybody of how we need to function to be productive and positive together. There are just some of the routines. Um, I don't know if Dr. Zarchan, if there's anything you'd like to add at that point. Um, no, I think it's helpful. You know, again, beyond individual staff members reaching out to students, 
it, counselors often serve as you know, the contact um, in addition to teachers and just kind of knowing where the students are and what's going on for individuals as well as the, the, the group of students in a building. Just having a, a, a pulse of what's going on is, is helpful. So, so just so I'm clear, is there a change in the strategy for second and third marking period or is the strategy the same throughout the year? So I would say the strategy is really renewing um, our routines and procedures. Uh, and so in that regard, I would say there's not a, a change in strategy. It's really a refreshing, a refreshment of routines and expectations. We do find often the, uh, during the winter months, uh, there's many holiday breaks and interruptions to learning, which is part of where routines and procedures start to slide um, and resetting those routines and procedures. I just had one kind of comment observation about attendance, um, especially as a mom um, after COVID and everything, um, you know, trying to be safe with your kids, not wanting to send your kids school sick. And a lot of times, um, you know, you just, you, you erred on caution. You kept your kids home. So they end up missing more school. Plus, you know, some parents, you know, they, their jobs don't align with the breaks that are in school. So taking their kids on vacation might not align with the time that they're allowed. So they're going to take out for that reason. How do we, or what, what can we do to help, you know, parents or something? Like, I feel like there's more absences because of illnesses now, less because the child's truly sick and should be out of school, and more because, you know, they don't want to send their kid with the sniffles or normal, you know, everyday stuff because they're, they don't want to, I don't know, be labeled or... Uh, the stigmatism, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying it right, but <laughs> I think you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I do, and I think that's exactly what our school nurses have communicated, right? Because they call and talk to parents, and parents want to be precautious. They want to be responsible. Um, and I think quite genuinely we're all finding our way forward around where is that comfort level of, like, you're going to be okay, you know, use, use your good manners with tissue and, and things like that. Um, I, I think it's, it will take us time. I think being in communication with our school health nurse, you know, call and, and talk through the, with the nurse what symptoms you're having and what is it uh, that you're worried about. Um, you know, families always have the option to uh, do home testing if, if you're concerned that it may be COVID. I know the symptoms for COVID really um, exhibit in the same way that sometimes sinus infections and, and cold symptoms do. So you can always do the home testing. I would always say you're welcome to call the school nurse and consult with the school nurse. And uh, there's always things like uh, masking. If we think it's a mild um, symptom, that's an option, uh, certainly not a requirement. But there are some of the things that I would encourage us to, to think about as we move forward. You know, we're all moving past what was really rather dramatic and, and uh, tra traumatic for many people, and we're all trying to figure out what is okay again. So th it's not a simple answer, but they are some of the common sense things that we can do as a community to support each other. I guess the only other thing, um, is there any other thought to um, putting out some new standards, updated standards as far as, because I think a lot of kids, are parents might be afraid to test their kid for COVID because they might have to stay home for five days or, you know, and it's really like we don't really know where we are with COVID right now as far as how it's going to affect certain people. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I just I feel like maybe an update um, school wide, county wide with um, with with, you know, administrations and parents and community health wise to start, you know, relieving that fear and letting our kids go back to school with the sniffles. Thank you. I'll take that back to the team. I would agree that communication and helping families understand where we are was the health department saying and what are what fears we can, you know, stand down or alleviate. We're, you know, anything we can do to, to keep each other um, clear on how to move forward is good. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Ms. Harvey? It's okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the tiers. Is tier two an intervention prior to when a student or when a student is approaching chronic absenteeism? Is that tier two? Yes. Okay. And one of the interventions was a letter given to the student to right. go home. Yes. Is so that communicated in other other ways besides a letter 
in the backpack yeah. about the absenteeism? Is that communicated to parents in other ways? Yes. Yeah, so when a student is brought to the attendance committee, there's phone calls. There, there starts to become routine phone calls to have conversations, home visits. Um, as things progress, uh, the, the letter and those resources are sent home, not just through a student, but they're also uh, mailed and shared with parents. Um, as ways to support families in helping to make sure that their student gets to school. Um, and so it's really like a menu of these are some uh, resources, how can we help you? Uh, these may be some things you haven't thought about. So, uh, but I do hear you that sending it home through the backpack with a student who may not be the most reliable <laughs> is not the only um, and, uh, method to use. Yeah. And then the last thing, and this really isn't for uh, necessarily for you to comment, it's a very complicated issue, is our students who are experiencing out-of-home placement and may be living in congregate settings and how the system <laughs> works with them where they may not have traditional parents involved in their lives to that degree, how we work with them to make sure they're successful as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions. I know that the achievement in the presentation focused on grades, um, but also the winter map results were posted. So would you be OK answering the questions about? Yes. Okay. So um, I know it, it talked about the 61st percentile, and then it also talked about the growth. So are, um, does MAP still give you the information as far as growth, of like who, you know, are they making high achievement and not growing, or is it low achievement? Do you still get the quadrants that will let you know those pieces? Yes. Oh, the schools do have access to that level of detail to be able to know how to support students instructionally with grouping um, and interventions. Have we looked at it more system-wide to see which groups of kids are growing and not growing versus just looking at it in the aggregate? I would say that um, we are looking at it r really more at the school level, level than as okay. a system. So, um, okay, and that's fine. And then um, with the 61st percentile, the grade two math seemed more severe than the other grades as far as the negative when you looked at the three years and going um, down, going the wrong direction as far as the percentage of kids meeting that 64. So that second grade, mat, kids who are in second grade now, so they were home for kindergarten and part of first or? So if they're in second grade now, first, first grade is when we experience the Omicron and Delta impact. And the year before that, okay. uh, the spring semester when they were in kindergarten, was when we were doing the phase in return to in-person learning. And the fall of their kindergarten year was when we were fully virtual. OK. And then when did they start Bridges, the current second graders? So they would have started, I don't have my chart okay, that, So they've me. been in, OK. It's just uh, any other ideas why that second grade is so much more discrepant than the other ones as far as the trend going the wrong way um, or the reasons I just. I, I don't. I, okay. I would have to get back okay. to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Did you? Oh. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, um, the next item on the agenda is an informational items, including the financial report for the month ending January 2023, kindergarten readiness, and update on school legislation. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates, um, comments, and agenda setting. So first we'll discuss any committee updates. Um, the links to the March committee meetings can be found on board docs under this agenda item. Um, Mr. McMillian, any updates from the audit committee? Uh, we're going to meet, I'm pretty sure it's August 11th, uh, as our next meeting at 4.30. I encourage the public to uh, tune into these. We do numerous, the internal audit department uh, reports on numerous studies and reports that they put together. So you might find that interesting, and I encourage you to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, budget Committee, Ms. Dominowski, any updates? No, uh, our next meeting will be um, April 12th, right after we get back from break. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Joes, anything about building contracts? 
Uh, our next Building and Contracts Committee meeting is on Monday, April 17th at 5 p.m. Thanks. Um, I'm Curriculum Committee. Um, I'm not sure when our next one is. It's it's an eight, coming up in April. Um, but staff is doing a really nice job preparing us, um, making sure that we really understand a little bit more about teaching reading so that when the recommendation for the series comes, we're better prepared. So I appreciate staff um, taking the time to help us with that. Um, Dr. Savoy, the Equity Committee. The next meeting will be after the holiday. Okay. I don't have the exact date at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hassan, Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. Thank you. Um, the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee met on March 16th. Um, I and Mr. Bazemore have been meeting with the Maryland Association of Boards of Education Legislative Committee. Um, we just met yesterday, and yesterday I personally, not on behalf of the board, testified in support of House Bill 175, which would give the next student member of the vote of the board a vote on the capital and the operating budget. Um, so it was a pleasure to spend time in Annapolis um, and testify on behalf of that. Um, and the next bud the next meeting woo, um, will be on April 20th at 4 p.m. Thank you. Um, policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. You heard some of our policies today, but our next meeting is um, Monday, April 24th. Okay, I'm gonna go back, thank you, to Ms. Dominowski. Do you have um, anything else you'd like to add? I, I know what you're referring to, and I don't have it um, okay. to go for. We just received the information requested at the last budget meeting this morning, so we haven't had time to discuss um, okay. whether or not we want to move forward or not. So I will, it's going to have to be on hold. That's fine. Thank you. Um, okay. And then next would be um, board member comments and agenda items. So um, is there anyone who has... Any comments you'd like to make or an agenda item at this time? Oh, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes, um, I would like some information regarding the security of our older buildings. Many of our newer buildings and renovations put a double entrance. Um, and I apologize if I'm using the incorrect terminology, but for example, visitors enter through the first set of doors and enter a vestibule before entering a second set of doors with access to the school building. Um, I would like to know how many of our buildings lack this type of entrance and if plans are in place for renovations to update building entrances to make our buildings as secure as possible. If plans are in place for renovations, what is the timeline for completion and are there temporary solutions in place to ensure that our buildings are secure? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Jones? Thank you. Um, Regardless of them on the board, I would like the board to get an update on the lead in our school water from uh, Office of Facilities um, on the next or future agenda. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like the board to receive a report on our instruction at the Baltimore County Detention Center in light of the recent letter about concerns of conditions of juveniles at the center. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you. Um, I think uh, it would be prudent for us to review the information in the kindergarten readiness uh, report that is an information as an actual agenda item. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Demonowski. Uh, I wanted to bring back up the review of personal devices, uh, cell phones in our schools, um, how we are you know, implementing that across the board. I think it has a lot to do with our school safety with our kids, and I, it would help if we had a conformity in that policy. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? So my comment is I'd like to um, thank our four outgoing board members. Um, Ms. Sexton seemed to have more definitive answer than I do at this point, where she feels like this is might be your last meeting, so I will use her timeline. So I'd like to thank Mr. Kuhn, Dr. Hager, um, Mr. Offerman, and Ms. Joes for sticking it out with us and helping us get a quorum and continuing the work. So thank you very much um, to all four of those board members. What did you say? Yeah, you want to make a comment, Ms. Joes? Go ahead. 
I, I just want to say thank you to everybody, especially Dr. Williams, staff, and members on the board. It has truly been an honor to serve in the Baltimore County Board of Education. I have done the best that I could for all children, and I've met some wonderful people and friends. And I would like all of the board members to remember that the reason most of us got on the board was for children, not just your children or my children or your friends' children, but for all children. And our decisions impact all of these children, especially the least amongst us. And some of these decisions are difficult, and I have made them. Um, that have been against my own children's schools. I have made those decisions. So we have to remember that we have to do what's good for all of our children and the greater common good. So I hope you always keep that in your mind. Um, that was my guiding light. So thank you. Thank you for that. And if there are no other comments, oh, Dr. Williams. I would like to make a comment. I will first want to thank the Office of Communication and the Ed Foundation and thank the board who attended. Um, I didn't hear any comments from the board, but we had our first state of the school address that we didn't have for three years. And so that was an opportunity to celebrate the success of our schools, our students, our staff. But I want to thank the staff from the Office of Communications uh, the Ed Foundation and their board for planning that big event. Um, we had it not as big as previous years because we were transitioning back. But I would like to acknowledge the four board members who attended, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, uh, Ms. Pumphrey, and Mr. McMillian for attending the State of the School Address, my first and last State of the School. But I definitely want to thank the staff because that was an opportunity, and I said it, we hear negative stories about students. This was an opportunity to highlight the successes of our students and staff. So I, I just wanted to put that out there uh, this evening um, before we go on spring break. Thank you. Yes. Thank, let's Thank acknowledge you. the staff. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. I think it was just the right size, to be honest with you. So um, our kids did wonderful. And Dr. Williams, thank you for the um, presentation you made at State of the Schools. It was very impactful. So at 829, I would like to wish everybody a wonderful spring break. A um, lot of celebrations, depending on what you celebrate. So enjoy your holidays with your family and friends. Um, and I don't think our next meeting will be this early. So we'll take advantage of it and we'll say adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.